righty, good afternoon, everybody. Hope you all enjoyed your lunch and all that good stuff. Uh, we got John Pellick up here with Microsoft, and he's going to be talking to you guys about how to enhance your mobile application with machine learning. John? Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everybody. How you all doing today? Um, thanks, good. Me too. Um, I'm John. I work on the Azure machine learning team for Microsoft, and we're going to take a look at a bunch of things, and here they are, right? So first, I'd like to take a look at some architectures for the Xamarin stack that would be friendly to building these kinds of intelligence features and smart um, capabilities into your application. Um, after that, I'm going to take a, on a very quick breeze through data science, right? No math, right? But we're going to take a peek at what this stuff's all about and the, sort of the foundation everything here sits upon. Um, after that, I'll show you how to do machine learning with the Azure ML Studio tool, and then I'll show you how to go ahead and use cognitive services within your application. Um, have you guys seen the cognitive services stack? Any of the demos that have come out for that? They're, pretty, they're a lot of fun, right? So we'll have a little fun with that. I might need a couple volunteers to come up here um, to test out the cognitive APIs. That would be fun and stuff to do, right? All right, so let's start out and uh, dive into the Xamarin architecture. Yeah, by the way, where does the name Xamarin come from? Anybody know? It sounds like a medication, doesn't it? Like, ask your doctor about Xamarin, you know? Oh, was it really? It was the name of a monkey. It makes sense, because we had the little monkey mascot, right? Yeah, that makes sense. Ah, oh, is it really? It's a gemstone? No kidding. If you, if you know the answer to this, tell me at the end, because I've, always, I've been asking this question a lot. It's the first time I've actually gotten answers that sound actually plausible about it. But um, I've worked with Xamarin for a few years um, before I actually was in Microsoft, um, then I left Microsoft and I came back. And while I was outside, I was doing mobile development on the Xamarin stack. And Xamarin came from you know, the Mono project, you know, Miguel de Acasa, right? We led this you know, quite a number of years ago. Um, you know, they were started out with a joint uh, effort with Microsoft and Novell, and then went on to be acquired by Attachmate, and Attachmate got purchased by uh, somebody else, I think, or when Attachmate acquired all that, it's just crazy. At any rate, these guys went and split off on their own, and they built their own mobile stack, taking the Mono framework, which worked and brought .NET to various uh, Linux builds onto the mobile platforms, right, for Android and iOS, and also for OS X, for that matter. And I thought it was a really brilliant approach to building mobile applications, right? So what they enabled you to do as a mobile developer is unify in the C-sharp programming language and using the Mono framework, right, you can go ahead and target all these different mobile platforms. It's really a very powerful approach. I'm sure you've heard about this all week, right? Um, one way you can go ahead and choose to build on the Xamarin stack is to go and put all your non-UI code into a thing called a portable class library. And then from that, you can have the compiler go ahead and make sure that you're only using specific types that'll work across all those platforms. Just check the guys that uh, you need there in these little check boxes, and it'll go ahead and make sure that you're using all the right types. That's a really nice uh, feature because you can then take that and build great native user experiences for any one of these platforms by putting a native head on top of it, right? You're still programming to Cocoa Touch, you're still programming to Lollipop or KitKat or Jelly Bean, but you're programming in C Sharp. So all the same abstractions, all the same types that you have there are available to you as a C Sharp developer, right? So that's a nice approach if you're building you know, applications that need to reach a couple platforms. Right? Um, but sometimes you need to go ahead and reach into the native device capabilities, right? So sometimes you need to talk to the camera at a, role, at a low level, make sure you're getting the most best quality images off a device. Or maybe you need to talk to the location sensor. Maybe you need to tweak and tune it in a way that allows you to be extra sensitive to, per to a person's location. Well, you can do that by way of dependency injection. Just um, define a common abstraction that all your classes can talk to in the portable class library, but then inject the native implementation of that in each platform. So if you use things like MVVM Cross or MVVM Lite, they all provide ways to go ahead and do this pretty uh, simply and easily. It's a really powerful approach. However, there's another technology that Xamarin offers, and uh, you should have all gotten this book, didn't you? You did? Um, did anybody, anybody get the book autographed or take the time to meet uh, Charles Petzold? Yeah, he was uh, downstairs the other day. Uh, Charles wrote uh, great books on Windows for you know, decades, including the real, you know, the essential tome for programming Windows back in the early 90s, and uh, so went and shook his hands. Nice to meet him finally. But Xamarin Forms allows you not only to go ahead and share the non-UI logic, it allows you to share the UI logic across platforms too, right? So this, that technology is evolving pretty rapidly. You can't do everything that you can do in the pure native implementation, but you can do quite a bit with it, and it's uh, certainly worth looking at. Uh, Charles wrote a really good book on it. It's worth working, working through. Um, finally. With the Xamarin, um, if you, whatever approach you take, right, Xamarin put together a nice site where there's a whole bunch of uh, co uh, components available for you for your selection and reuse. Um, have you guys been up on components.xamarin.com? Uh, let me just uh, show you to you really quick, because I have a nice fading effect here for a demo. And this is not much yet, but the point of the Xamarin components 
is it allows you to quickly go ahead and filter down um, the libraries that you want to go ahead and support, right? So here's a whole bunch of components that are available for um, reuse within your application. Each of the, uh, some of them are for sale, but many of them are free, right? And each one will indicate these little glyphs here which platforms it supports, right? So what's nice about this is, right, in some cases you have to have a native implementation, but in some cases maybe you just want to talk to a REST API, right? And um, it turns out there's implementations out there that allow you to go ahead and handle all the fussiness with dealing with the HTTP stack and getting your request headers right and putting the right verb in the right place. You don't have to bother with that. REST Sharp provides a nice way to go ahead and do that. So just go ahead and download this and drop it into your application. So let's get into an overview of uh, data science now. How many people here are data scientists? Excellent, so one or two of you, right? Um, I took an online course certificate series in data science. I um, wouldn't call myself really a data scientist, but I have gotten through the course, at least, and not passed that. There's a lot of interest in this field, and I'm gonna try to motivate for you what it is that data science is all about without resorting to deep, you know, wonky kind of math, right? So let's take a peek at it. All right, so Ask yourself this question first, right? If you're hiking down a mountain, what's the fastest way down? How would you find it? You know, hike down, just hike it down the mountain, ro you know, grab some ropes, jump off a cliff, get a wingsuit, what would you do, right? Well, it turns out that this is relevant in the world of data science because what the machine learning models often try to compute is the most least cost way to find the best fit line for your data, right? And it does that by doing a thing called the gradient descent. The gradient descent is the same way you'd go down the mountain fastest, right? Take a look at where you're standing, go point down the steepest path of descent, take your next step, keep doing that over and over again. That's done with vector calculus that you don't have to worry about because the tools go ahead and compute this for you. All right, what about Guinness? What does, anybody have an idea what Guinness has to do with the world of data science? Insert joke here, you know, right? So, um, it turns out, right, that back maybe about 100 some years ago, um, the Guinness Brewery was trying to go ahead and come up with a very effective way to test the quality of the pints of Guinness Extra Stout. And they hired a mathematician, this guy, uh, William Seeley Gossett from uh, Oxford, and he came up with a way to go ahead and give you a good degree of mathematical certainty that if you drink a few pints out of this cask, it's likely that it's going to be a good, um, a, a good or a bad sample, right? He'd give you a way to tell that. That's called the T-test. So that shows up a lot in um, machine learning and data science. Um, it's also springtime, there's irises in bloom, and so what, right? What does that mean? What does that have to do with data science? Anybody have a guess about this one? Uh, there's a guy named uh, Ronald Fisher, right, who was doing statistical work on plants and seeds and how well they grew, right? And he built a lot of the um, statistical models that were used to go ahead and help people produce and get better crop yield, plant yield, right? So this data set shows up in quite a few places in uh, classic you know, data science samples. We're gonna take a look at it a little later on today. All right, so um, machine learning simple, right? It gets, you can even do it manually, and we're gonna actually do, build a machine learning model here with no math whatsoever, right? Or maybe a little bit, but not a lot. All right, so this is another classic data set in the world of machine learning, right? Um, this is a, a data set that relates diamonds, right? Showing you the uh, price of a diamond versus the weight of the diamond, right? So carrots are, right, the weight, right? The bigger the carrot weight is, right? The, oh, there they are, right? heavier your diamond is, right? And you would expect to get the price to increase as the weight of the diamond increases, right? So one way you can get a look at what's going on in this is, of course, to plot this, right? So if you take the weight of the diamond, you put it there on the x-axis, right? And you take the price of the diamond and put it on the y-axis, you can then go ahead and pick a couple points out of this mix, right? Um, picking, you're not seeing it, but it's picking this top point here, um, 1.01, .01, and the price is 73.66. Uh, if you plot the two of those or you plot that point, you can see where they connect on the axes, right? So now if you repeated that process for every point in your data set, you can see how they all sort of, you know, scatter out there on your plot. And what's the next natural thing you might want to do with this if you're going to try to build some sort of model to predict it? You might want to draw a line through that, right? So you could draw a line. Would you draw any line, though? I mean, why, why would we pick that line? Right, it's the best fit, right? Remember that gradient descent with trying to find the steepest way down the mountain? Machine learning algorithms use that approach to go ahead and find the line that fits best through a bunch of points, right? That's pretty good. So to get that line up there and going now, you can use this if you have a, a diamond of any weight. Let's say you have 1.4 carats here, right? You could then go ahead and then, you know, 
go up you know, from the x-axis and then go over to the y-axis and see what price you'd expect there, right? So that looks like it's about $8,000 you'd expect for a 1.4 carat diamond, right? Makes sense, right? And going a little bit further with this, right, um, you might, oh, it's not, the color washed out. I'm very sorry about this. I don't know if you can see where I'm tracing with this red dot, right? There's a gray rectangle around this line, right? It has the same slope as the line, right? But it contains all the points, right? What that does is that actually gives me a thing called a confidence interval, right? So now I can not only make a prediction about and say, you know, a 1.4 carat diamond, I should expect $8,000 for it, but because I'm making a prediction, I can't be totally sure, right? Well, if I use all those points, then I, you know, I can get an idea about how wide the range is here, and that's what that confidence interval is, right? So I think that my 1.4 carat diamond is gonna probably cost 8,000 bucks, but it'll, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be between 6,000 and 10,000. And guess what? That's the regression model in, mach in machine learning. That's essentially what the machine is trying to do when it builds this, right? That's known as linear regression, in case you're interested in the jargon. And um, again, we didn't need any math to do that. We can just derive that graphically, right? Now, this gets a lot more complicated when you have lots and lots of factors and variables, right? But that's essentially what it's trying to do, right? So data science is easy, right? <laughs> it's uh, Except you can't just use any data, right? So. Let's uh, talk about some factors that matter here, right? So the quality of your data is really important, right? And it matters that your data is relevant and not irrelevant, all right? So what this slide is trying to show you is, um, is where I come from the city of Boston and uh, people from Boston tend to get upset about the Red Sox, right? And they tend to drink a lot. So people are wondering whether, I'm just saying, right? But tend to see whether there's any sort of correlation between that, right? Maybe you know you could have the check the price of a gallon of milk and the Red Sox batting average and correlate that to blood alcohol content. However, that's not going to give you that's going to give you kind of wacky results, big wide confidence interval, right? If you checked people's body mass and the number of margaritas it gets down, that's probably a way better predictor of uh, blood alcohol content. And when you're building a machine learning model, right, each one of these rows is known as an observation, right, and each one of these columns becomes known as a feature, right? You want to pick features that are good and help you predict this guy on the right-hand side, which is called the label, right? Another thing about your data is you want your data to actually be there, right, instead of having big gaping holes and blanks, right? If you were trying to predict um, how good a burger was, right, and you're trying to predict it based on the grill temperature and the weight of your hamburger patty, right, but you don't have one of those two variables, right, it's going to make your predictions a lot worse. And if you've done big data science experiments, you actually go ahead and see that out. And a lot of times what data scientists do is they scrub all these uh, data out in the first place before they ever go and try to build a predictive model. Sometimes they'll substitute in a, you know, a, random, uh, a random value or average value or a zero, but they do something with it to handle it, right? So make sure your data has actual values in it. Another thing is that data quantity is important, right? What's this a picture of? Anybody want to guess? Sunsets, yeah, it has a sunset in it, that's right. Uh, it has water in it too, but not a lake. Let's give you a little more data. How about now? Venice, that's right, it's the Grand Canal. When you have enough data, you can go ahead and see that clearly. If you don't have enough data, you can't get there, right? And this is, also applies in uh, machine learning, right? Especially with things like neural networks, which are trying to look at patterns and guess, you know, what you know, somebody hand wrote or what you know, image contains is all about. You have to give it a lot of data and a lot of stuff to train on, right? So, you know, the, the more the better in a lot of these cases. All right, oh, data visualization is also really important, right? And it really can help um, you understand your data set really well when you get a good, you know, I insight as to what it is, right? So let's start with this uh, mystery data here, right? So Take a peek at what we have, right? We have three columns of data, right? The first column is this thing X, right? The second column is this thing Y. It looks like a bunch of floating point numbers. And the third column are um, these uh, letters, right? S, L, C, or there's another one in there too, I think R, right? Um, anybody want to guess what this data is? Right, um, these histograms, you think they might help you, right? But I don't know if they're helping us too much. Right? So let's take a peek, right? If you zoomed in and you did a histogram of each of these pieces of data, you could see that, you know, there's a couple places where things are clustering up in the X and clustering up in the Y, right? These labels C, S, L, and R, eh, who knows what those are, right? Another plot you can go ahead and do is this thing called a box plot. It's going to show you different, you know, aspects of how many, you know, the points are contained within certain ranges, but that doesn't really show you anything yet. But one thing that does come up or might jump out at you, um, how else might you want to plot this? Anybody want to take another, want to guess at another kind of plot that might be useful here? Uh, how about you have X and Y, that's a hint. 
So usually those are scatter plots, right? So, um, and if you did a scatter plot and you put the x value on the x-axis and the y value on the y-axis, so you might find out what your data is, right? And then if you use that label column to go ahead and let's say set some other factor about your data, you might find out that they clump together in a certain way, right? So the L's are these left eyes, the you know the R's are the yellows are the right eye, right? S is a smile, L is the you know, and or the outlier is the outline, or O, whatever it is. But that's the point about the data. It's not so mysterious anymore what this data is. But you'd have no idea just by looking at the table. So I'm going to show you a tool that Microsoft Research has built and put out there called, um, that allows you to explore data, and uh, hopefully this will illustrate this. Um, has anybody seen this tool called Sandance? If you haven't, it's a nice tool. It's available up on that uh, URL that's right there. That's uh, www.sandance.ms. And let's take a peek at it. This is great. Meeting reminders. Actually, first, let's look at the Iris Flower data set, right? This is that guy uh, uh, Fisher I was mentioning. That's where I got the image from. And Fisher was trying to, um, be, oh, you can't see anything. Why can't you see this? Because I'm still in the slideshow. Right, here's Fisher, right? And here's his Iris data, right? And basically what he's trying to use is these numbers here to go ahead and predict the species of iris flower, right? It could be a setosa, it could be a versicolor, it could be a virginica, right? So I've gone and just downloaded that data set and turned it into a CSV file. And here they are, there's 150 of these points, I think. Yeah, 151 with the header, right? So if I take these data, um, I'm trying to go ahead and see whether there's any sort of pattern to um, what we got here. And the Sandance tool is pretty helpful for that. So by popping this open, this is my iris data set, right? These are all the points that came out. It gives me a number of uh, visualizations for this to see whether there's something that's distinguishing about that, right? So this tool is built on uh, WebGL. If you, have any of you ever used that technology, WebGL? It's nice, it uses the uh, GPU to accelerate graphics within uh, the web browser, works on mobile devices, right? So this doesn't really tell us very much yet here, right? Um, I guess a sepal is a part of a flower, right? So there's the petals, the obviously the, you know, the nice you know, colorful part, sepals some other part that's related to the flower. Let's see if we could flip that around and see if that tells us anything. And again, we're not really seeing much in the data, but maybe if we start to color it by the species, you know, Maybe this is going to tell us something. Look at that. So our petal length might be useful. Petal width. Yeah, it's starting to clump together. Um, but we can do better than that. We can do a scatter plot and plot these against one another and maybe see if they come into view a little bit better here. Let's take petal length versus petal width. And we'll go ahead and bring these. Well, that's actually petal width versus petal width, so no wonder it lies in a line. You can see now, right, that we're starting to be able to separate out our data into different clumps and groups here, right? So that's important when you're trying to build something that predicts, right? You might want to be, be predicting the cost of an apartment. You might be predicting how your, what your sales are going to be next month, whatever, right? So doing these kinds of pattern detection is really a nice, helpful thing. This is a tool that's free that's uh, made by uh, MS Research, and, you know, it's also, it's worth to go ahead and explore. Um, you can do even uh, bigger data sets than this. Um, just to give you a quick sample of the kinds of things you can do. So in addition to drinking lots of beer, people from the uh, city of Boston also tend to complain a lot. And when they complain, they call up the mayor. They use a funny accent too, which. Uh, but this is um, the 311 calls to the mayor's office. And what you can start to see that is if you have data that's geocoded, right, that you have a nice way to go ahead and visualize this. And then if you now go ahead and color your data by Let's say subject, right? You might be able to see what people are calling about. Or if we color this by neighborhood, we might be able to see where the calls are clustered most together, right? It looks like we got a lot here in this one area, and that's the Beacon Hill neighborhood. I'm able to go ahead and isolate this out quickly. And then I could even go ahead and decide to facet this by subject, let's say. And I can start to see what's going on in, it looks like we have lots of public work call, public works calls happening, you know, in the Beacon Hill neighborhood, right? So with just a couple clicks, now I got this kind of insight about my data. It might give me something to go ahead and investigate. So 
that's a nice little tool to go ahead and uh, do this. Data scientists uh, tend to explore their data and that becomes a very important part of what they do, right? Cleaning the data, ex exploration. All right, so we were down here. All right, so that's some underpinnings of how you might uh, go ahead and use Xamarin, and how you might go ahead and look into your data for data science. We got through that without too much pain. Uh, let's take a peek now at the tools that Microsoft makes to go ahead and allow you to build these kinds of models up from it, right? So one tool is this thing called Azure ML Studio. This is a team that I work on, and we're based up in Boston. Um, our mission is to make machine learning accessible, and you know, so anybody can go ahead and do this stuff. Um, in order to help make it accessible, we made it free. So if you ever want to use this tool, you can go ahead and, and uh, you don't have to even provide us with a credit card. We'll give you free access to the tool, right? It's up on uh, studio.azureml.net. And um, this is part of the broader Cortana intelligence suite, right? So there's a whole bunch of products, again, that are related to doing advanced analytic scenarios. And we'll actually see the cognitive services as part of the broader offering that we provide, right? But this is basically a cloud-based approach. Um, and what we tried to do was take the work of the few people who have this really specialized knowledge and broaden it out for the, um, for the rest of us to go ahead and communicate and uh, consume and use, right? So the ML alg algorithms, when they say best of Microsoft, um, they basically mean Microsoft Research, right? So um, it's hard to get into work with Microsoft Research. You have to be, uh, you know, have a pretty storied academic career, right? And be doing stuff that's really intensive and related to this kind of stuff. But those folks are um, in a few places for us, right? We have some folks out in Redmond doing this work, some folks in Boston, and also some folks over in the UK at Cambridge, right? And they come up with these algorithms that will allow you to go ahead and make these kinds of predictions, right? In fact, they even gone to the trouble to wrangle them in different, you know, camps here. There's about 25 that are available in the tool right now. Um, this is some pretty nerdy stuff, right? So um, you might need a support vector machine or a two-class boosted decision tree, right? Um, or you might just want to just go ahead and make use of what these PhD folks have already developed for you, right? So we try to go ahead and make that easy for folks to do. And these technologies are ended up now online plugged into things like the Bing prediction engine or behind Cortana or the Skype translation engine, right? All end up using this stuff underneath the covers. So building off of what the folks who do the heavy duty algorithm work is this Azure Machine Learning Studio, right? So you don't have to go ahead and understand how to build all these you know, um, high powered models. Instead, you can just go ahead and make use of them. And this is targeted for people who are data scientists or even people who aren't, right? IT pros should be able to go ahead and make use of this. Um, and we make this accessible by, in a couple ways. So one thing we do is we provide a thing called a gallery, and the gallery gives you a place where people can go ahead and publish these experiments and their results and share this stuff, right? So you get a nice boost up from uh, the scratch, and then you can pop open stuff you find in the gallery here in this place called um, Azure ML Studio, and you can go ahead and build machine learning experiments, and then um, you can even go ahead and have a little button down at the bottom that says set up a web service, and once you build your machine learning model, you can go ahead and use this now to publish as a web service pretty quickly. And that'll be operationalized and put into service right out in the Azure cloud, and then you can go ahead and consume it from any device anywhere you are. And so let me uh, show you how that works. And they just rebranded this Cortana Intelligence Gallery. It was Cortana Analytics Gallery before this, and so we keep us on our toes here, right? But let's say I was investigating um, irises, and I wanted to find a way to go ahead and classify them. Uh, typing iris into the search uh, box here gives me a way to go ahead and find an experiment that might be related to this. And that sounds interesting. Does a naive Bayes classifier, I don't know what that is, but I do know what irises are. So let's click Open in Studio and see how this goes. So what should happen now is it'll pop me into the Azure Machine Learning Studio. This was going a little bit slow before, so I pre-prepared it if, um, if this doesn't go quickly. But I just tell it where uh, I I'd like to go ahead and land my experiment and what workspace I'd like to use. And what it's gonna do now is take the data and all the code, right, that was in there to build that predictive model and actually install it here inside uh, the Machine Learning Studio. And if these little swirlies don't stop in a moment or two, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, go to the page and open it while I prepped it. Well, let's let that cook in the background. I'll show you how to do one of these from scratch. So we provide a way to go ahead and tour this environment, but 
if you want to create a machine learning experiment, it's pretty simple. Just go ahead and click this bu uh, blank experiment. It gives you a little stencil here that gives you an idea about um, what you might want to do. I actually loaded the Iris data set before, so that will show up in my, in my data sets. So here's that same Iris data we're looking at. If I want to go ahead now and build a model out of that, it's a matter of just doing a little bit of dragging and dropping, right? So the first thing I would do would take my data, I'd um, split it into two pieces. When you build machine learning data models, you tend to go ahead and have it, you know, train on some of the model and then you test on the other half of it. So I'm telling it here to split it 70-30. And then what I want to do is train a machine learning model. So training the machine learning model takes my data in, but it also needs an algorithm to go ahead and train on. So let's do multi-class. Here's one, multi-class decision for us. This looks like this might be helpful to us. Let me zoom out a little bit. And this multi-class decision for us is gonna be used on that data to generate a model for me. When I get done with that, my next step is to evaluate the model. I evaluate the model by taking what this algorithm would predict. It's a little angry, hang on. Okay. It needs me to tell it what column to predict. I wanna predict the species. Remember, we're trying to predict the species of iris. That's happy. I don't want to evaluate the model yet. I'm sorry. I want to go ahead and score the model. And scoring the model allows me to take whatever came out of that training step and then use it, my test data to test it out to see how well it did. And then finally, I can go ahead and pop it into this evaluator and see just how well it's predicting things. All right, I do that, and I have now created a machine learning experiment. If I press run, it's going to go ahead and send this all up to the cloud, make my magic swirlies of data go out there. And what you start to see is on these little nodes inside the object graph, there'll be these little, um, uh, they actually went very quickly, right? There's these little check marks, right? They would spin if they were queued for execution. But this should be done. And when I get done here, what I should see in my scored model, if I go to visualize it, what I should see is these species of data and I should be able to compare this to the scored label. And this is gonna tell me, right, how well it got things right and how well it got things wrong, right? So um, the color blue is generally a happy color in Windows and uh, Microsoft Azure, so th the blues are good here, and that one looks like it got one wrong here, right? So that's one machine learning algorithm. Um, I could go ahead and um, there's more, but I'm not happy with that one, so. Let's try one more and see whether we can compare a couple of these. Multi-class logistic regression, that sounds like a lucky one. Let's try that. So if I go through the same process here, and I do training. Do the same thing, right, where I feed this into here. Grab my training data set, put it into here. Tell it that I want to try to predict the species. then score my model. Same thing here, I'm gonna score with the test data. And then finally, I'm gonna grab this guy and drag it to the evaluation module. Let's go ahead and run it now, see how the second algorithm does. This is running for a little bit longer, six seconds. There's a little spinny of uh, running, and it looks like it's done now, which is good. So I can go ahead and now take a peek at this evaluation module, and it's gonna show me how these two worked against one another. And if you take a peek, right, what it's telling me is, for the first algorithm, right, the one on the uh, left there, right, it was able to go ahead and get two of the species entirely right for my prediction, but it got something wrong with that VersaColor uh, type iris, right? The second algorithm did way better, right? Just got, and nailed everything, got it totally right. So, not bad. 
So now if I wanted to build a predictive model and use this, right, well, we have an easy way to do this. We can just build a predictive web service, click that button. But it says, I need to tell it which model I want to use. Well, the one on the right ended up doing better. So now if I tell it I'd like to set up that web service, it should be a little bit happier. It's going to create an experiment for me, do some fancy animation to group these things together, clump it all down, gratuitous animation. So it's now created a predictive experiment for me, which could go as a web service. And if I run it once, I'm able to then go ahead and deploy this up to Azure. Take a moment or so. It's been running for a couple seconds. Finish running. If I go deploy it, this is now a web service that's going to be up in the Azure cloud momentarily. And I can even go ahead and test this out. Um, so we should test out this web service. Let me just open Excel again really quickly. By sending it some, you know, some fake data, and let's see whether we can predict. Let's make some stuff up. So let's give it values that we think are going to produce a Sentosa flower, right? So how about 4.8 and 3.3, 1.5 and 2? Let's remember that. 4.8, 3, 5.1 and 2, is that what I said? 0.2? Sorry about that. It actually runs that web service. It's a little bit hard to see. But if you look at the results here, it's guessing that the species of the flower here is versicolor. I think I put bad values in there. Let's try again. Isn't that easy to read, huh? We're, I'm, it's my job to go ahead and fix that so I can actually read that. Tiny little font. Let's try 5, 3, 1 .5, 0 0.2. And in our tiny little font, it's pretty confident that it's the first species, the first species is Setosa, right? So the model looks like it's pretty reasonably working. We're going to get a better visualization than that, right? That's how simple it is to go ahead and build uh, from, a, from scratch, build a machine learning model, and then operationalize it up in the web. So now let's get to the fun stuff. Boy, we're running out of time here. Because the fun stuff is not that, but rather these cognitive services. All right, great. All right, so beyond machine learning models, right, um, to make things uh, that use these kinds of intelligence features and make them more consumable for developers, we've taken a bunch of the research work we did and we put REST APIs in front of them so that you can go ahead and do some interesting things. Um, one example that you might remember, um, has anybody seen the Towel.net? This was a big thing at the previous build, not this year's build, but what the idea was was that you can give it a photo, and right, it would use our face detection software to figure out where the faces were in the photo, and then try to take a guess at what gender you are and what um, how old you are, might be, right? And this became you know quite a you know viral sensation for a little while here, right? So once people saw this, they started you know messing around with it, and pretty quickly we had 80 million people using this with uh, 500 million images and blasted off around the world, right? Which is kind of interesting, but what if we took the same technology and figured out, you know, is this a, a way we can use this to go ahead and make recommendations to people, right, that might be more appropriate for their gender or age or other factors? Or can we predict when people might come back so we can better plan you know, inventory, those kinds of things in the store? Or could we go ahead and push out information that's relevant to a person as they're in the right location at the right time if they were willing to tell and tell us about this kind of stuff? So we used um, these technologies um, up in the Cortana Cloud, right, using the, our analytics engine, right, basically to make these kinds of connections, and this is a little bit of marketing slides, right, but the idea is that if we can go ahead and take the stuff you've already seen, building the machine learning models, and then go ahead and extend it out so we can have better visualizations of it and also more consumable APIs, then we got a shot to making some interesting stuff happen here. So the way these cognitive services work are they're grouped into five different camps. Um, they provide features that will allow you to do vision type features in your application or speech app um, type uh, features, language recognition, um, knowledge management features, um, or even some uh, stuff that does some, some interesting search work too, right? 
And you know, this is manifested at stuff that was you know, formerly pretty hard to do, right? It wasn't easy to go ahead and build or make use of computer vision if in your application or uh, speaker recognition or text analytics. So these things are pretty straightforward to use, right? Um, the face APIs will allow you to do things like face detection or see if two people are the same or maybe look for people who have similar faces and that has all these also comedic possibilities right there, right? You can group people, um, identify people, um, you could, with the speech APIs, figure out who's speaking, not just what is spoken, right? Which is uh, useful in a lot of situations, right? You can also, you know, generate speech and, you know, also try to get people's intent out of what they're saying, right? Doing, uh, combining text analytics and, you know, text to, uh, speech to text um, capabilities. And speaking of text analytics, we can do sentiment analysis or key phrase extraction, language detection, topic detection, these kinds of things, right? Um, I remember topic detection being a product, you know, uh, under active research about 20 years ago. It's nice to see it now digested to a place where it's pretty useful and uh, pretty straightforward. And the way you make use of it is also pretty straightforward. So let's say you wanted to try emotion detection. Um, you'd simply need to go ahead and sign up for the API and then go ahead and at that URL, right, make a REST um, call, right? In this case, the verb is get. If it's not explicitly stated, it's a get call. And in the request body, you're sending it some JSON. So here we're sending it the uh, URL of an image and the response that comes back is pretty rich, right? So we have here, within the photo, it's telling you where it thinks it detected the face, right? Which is, you know, semi-useful information, but it's also scoring from the features it found on the face, um, what emotion it thinks is present in the photo, right? So this is gonna be a number that ranges between zero and one, right? So if it's low, like, you know, e to the minus eighth or something, right? There's, you know, probably very little of that inside uh, this, um, that, that emotion in this picture. Um, so in this case, it looks like whoever is at that URL is pretty happy. But let's see this in action, right? So this is where we're gonna have me make goofy, goofy faces at the camera, so we'll see how this goes. Okay, it's a little demo app that we haven't released to the public yet, but I've been yelling at people to release it because people are gonna have a lot of fun playing with this. And what this allows you to do is, you know, basically you know, test out these APIs. So here it's gonna go ahead and take a look at me and I'm gonna, well, that's not a good photo. Uh, maybe a little bit younger, all right, let's see. Stand here, count down, take another photo. Let's see if I smile if it'll go a little better here. Come on. How are we going? No, not good? Tilted my head, shouldn't have done that. Let's see, come on, baby. Forty, oh, I'm getting older, okay. <laughs> I am 48, so that, that hit, hit it right in the head there, all right. So now let's go ahead. <laughs> Don't smile is the uh, key to this, right? You can also do things like try to predict what breed of dog you might be based upon your features. Let's see. <laughs> Mildly willful. My wife will tell you that I'm willful, but not very independent. All right. So, um, also allows you to go ahead and try to you know see if you can actually see how these things you know match up. Right. So, I don't have to smile. Let's get to start. Right. So. These are the different emotions that it detects, right? So let's see if we can generate um, surprise. So, yep. <laughs> uh, contempt. Yeah, it's anger. Okay, yeah, it gets. <laughs> it's a challenge to try to get all these together. Um, I, um, I found a good way to get, um, <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. But wait, there's more. Uh, so you, you can actually, you don't have to go ahead and use this though, um, directly. <laughs> I'm an Irish setter now, okay. Um, there's, you can go up to our portal and try these out yourself right today, right? So you could go to, let's see. Cognitive services. And you can take your own very own photos and uh, go ahead and upload these, right? So let's take a look at these uh, motion detection APIs. 
and somewhere down here is a sample page. Should have viewed the responses. Okay, let's give this a shot. So I can go ahead and pick up an image. Um, so here's my son was messing with my cell phone. There we go. What's, let's see. He gets a disgust. He gets a lot of disgust there. All right, that's good. Let me pick another one. Here's me after running. And I am neutral. I'm mostly neutral. How about that? That's not true, right? Um, I don't think it works on animals. Let's take a peek. Those are my cats. And there's a part, yep, it shows that part. So it actually does recognize human faces, right? So um, just so you know, that photo was. So a photo like that, it won't recognize, right? It doesn't see any human faces in there. But that's kind of interesting, right? A um, couple other things it can do, right, besides make uh, goofy, th goofy things there. Um, it can detect emotion in uh, real time as it's going by, right? So um, it should be able to now pick up from just messing around here in my age, right? But it should also see if I'm starting to be happy or I'm really happy now and it's just a fantastic day. And right? So you see that green there. I'm sorry, wait, let me put this back. So that, that green is tied to the happiness emotion, right? So I can see that in real time, right? I'm pretty happy and let's say you're angry and disgusted and it's the East Coast and I want to wave my hands and stuff, right? You can see that, you know, I was picking up there's anger in uh, the voice too, right? Which can be actually useful if you're, um, you know, let's say you have an application, let's say you make a Microsoft product and, you know, you want to find out how people are reacting to it. You can actually use these APIs to go ahead and uh, do that kind of testing and uh, get some interesting feedback. So, you know, that's not too hard to program, right? So as I showed you in that other, um, in that other um, you know, web page demo there, right? You can actually just get back the JSON response, and it's very simple. Just a little JSON object graph tells you all this information, right? You can actually make you know, 10 or 20 of these calls per second, I think, before we throttle you. So you can get some pretty high frame rates going on here. Let's see if there's any other interesting demos. Um, so one other, this wasn't working before when I tried it, so I'm gonna tr but I'm gonna try it again now, right? This is attempting to go ahead and make a product recommendation for you based upon a photo that it took. So let's see if it'll, do this, or let's let's see if it'll record sound. Hang on. I'm not seeing the industry cartana. Let's pause this. How does this one work? Yeah, this one's not gonna do what I expect. Let me go to the text analytics demo. Hang on. See this one? I think it's this one. Whoops, we keep you know, waiting for it to initialize. So this is, I think this is the demo that's trying, oh, let me pause that for a second. This is the demo that's trying to detect um, emotion in, in uh, or, or, or sentiment analysis. Let's try this. I really, really am happy to be here and I just love Florida. Let's try that. All right, so it thinks I'm happy, right? Boy, the weather really stinks in New England. Yeah, negative, right? So it's inferring, right? Uh, the algorithms aren't too hard to go ahead and figure this stuff out, right? It, it picks out certain words and assigns a weight to them, right? And it builds a big rec recommendation matrix based upon this, right? But given this kind of capability, right, not only can you do sentiment analysis on written text, but you can even go ahead and have what's spoken be converted into written text and then sent out for the sentiment analysis. Some of the algorithms are a little more sophisticated where they'll actually go ahead and you know, check out the spectrum of your voice compared to a baseline and then go ahead and decide whether you're stressed or not. Right? But um, this stuff's all available um, just behind a set of simple REST APIs you can go ahead and make use of. And um, so it's certainly worth checking out. And I think I'm at the end of my talk. So henceforth and in conclusion, it wouldn't be a Microsoft presentation without a call to action or several calls to action from here. And so we would like you, we'd really dearly like it if you'd go ahead and, and uh, make use of uh, the Xamarin stack, right, to go ahead and build great mobile apps. Um, the components will help you get you know, moving really fast. Consum consuming all these REST APIs is really easy to do with uh, just the REST Sharp component right there. And uh, you can pop that in that works on Android, iOS, and Windows, right? Um, 
embrace you know, data science. It's you know a little bit you know wonky kind of stuff, but it's also um, not too difficult to go ahead and get your head around at least the rough underpinnings of what it's trying to do. And uh, make sure that you know you take tools to go ahead and explore your data. Right, Sandis is a good one. Power BI works. There's all kinds of great tools out there for this. Right, if um, and it's, it's definitely worth looking through your data before you go ahead and try and present it and build models. Once you're ready to do that. Um, you can go ahead and pick up somebody else's model from the Cortana gallery, right? Or you can go ahead and use our tool, Azure ML Studio, to go ahead and build that. It's pretty simple to go ahead and turn it into a web service. And then uh, finally, if you want to add these really intelligent features for uh, your applications, um, you can go ahead and make use of our cognitive APIs. Um, they're up and available today. And uh, they're um, pretty easy to uh, use. And I could take questions now if you have any questions. Yeah, go ahead. Actually, somebody might come around with a mic, I think. So just hold on a moment. He wasn't expecting me to finish in time because I had 88 slides, so. That was pretty fast for 88 slides, huh? I had a lot of coffee today. <laughs> Question. That model that you created, or I'm um, sorry, the, the model that you trained and created and, and yes. published it, would that be available through um, an Azure mobile s uh, service? Like uh, the, I'm trying to think, it's not called um, the Azure mobile services anymore, but it would it be available through that, or does it has, have its own API or REST API? Okay, so it has an API endpoint, right, that you can call, right? And there, I didn't show it to you, right, but there's a page after you publish it that'll show you where the endpoint is. It has a key that you can go ahead and embed in the calls to make sure that only people who are authorized call it. And then um, from there, it shows you what the payload will look like, right, for both request and response, right? So it's available at that endpoint within Azure. It's also publishable to a gallery if you want to make it open for the public, right? So obviously there's all kinds of flavors in between that you'd want to do there, right? You might want to make it so that, you know, you might want to make that a lot more robust and we're working on that right now. So, yep. a question in front, sorry. Oh, sorry, what, I'm, we're done, yeah. Hey, I'm done, this is, this is the last question, or I'm really done now. So the question is, um, is this a pretty open-ended algorithm or it's really spe specific to faces. So for example, let's say if I wanted to, just for the sake of the example, if I wanted to um, determine whether somebody in the picture is wearing short-sleeved or long-sleeved shirt. Specific to faces, right? In this case, it's, it'll give you a lot of information about the face. Like not only will it tell you where it thinks it is in the photo, it'll tell you like you know, a whole bunch of different features on the face. Eyes here, nose is there, right? Corners of mouths are here, right? ears are there. And it'll even tell you how it thinks the face is oriented, right? What's the picture of the head? Are you pointed down, pointed up, looking here, looking there, right? Right, but, but I can't train for something arbitrary no, like that. No, it's trained specifically for human faces. It didn't even recognize my cats. Right? Well, anyway, I'm, I'm out now officially out of time. Thank you very much. Have a great day.